The murder of Mary Fagan has to be one of the most controversial and tragic moments in Georgia's long and storied history. And what needs to be said about this murder is that much greater context, both politically and socially, exists than is often portrayed when telling the story of both her murder and the lynching of Leo Frank two years later, falsely accused of the crime. Now, as the story should be told, the Deep South was undergoing rapid social changes. From 1900 to 1910, the city of Atlanta nearly doubled in size as rural agricultural workers moved to industrial centers while the price of cotton nearly collapsed. The economy was in shambles, and in 1906, a play came out called The Klansman. This was a predecessor to the movie Birth of a Nation, and after this play had come out, blacks were incorrectly identified as a cause for this cultural and social shift, and people began murdering them willy-nilly. In fact, they say that dozens of black men were killed in Atlanta, and we may never get a clear picture of how many people were murdered. Well, the lynching of Leo Frank actually came out after that play was turned into a movie. But before I go into Leo Frank's lynching, it should be noted that Mary Fagan worked 60 hours a week at the pencil factory, and the details around her murder provide a little bit of context for who very likely killed her. Now, Leo Frank was the superintendent of this factory, and because the South was industrializing, Leo Frank was widely hated by a huge part of Marietta. The owner and superintendent of the National Pencil Factory, he was a graduate of Cornell University and had only lived in Georgia for five years. However, he made ripples in the Jewish community after marrying the daughter of a prominent Jewish rabbi here in the city. So everybody kind of knew him, and he was very out spoken, but he was also, he looked weird, and the girls who were in the factory with him said that he kind of gave them very unusual or creepy vibes. And when Mary Fagan went to go pick up her paycheck, the metal shipment had not come in yet. And so she was working reduced hours and walked in anyway on the morning of the weekend that she had off to go get her paycheck. Now, this was at the same time that a Confederate memorial parade was going through town. So you can see how they're still trying to express the cultural attitudes of the Confederacy and rejection of basically Yankee cultural and economic domination, and she's going to the pencil factory where she's murdered at that very same day. You can see how social attitudes would have clashed from her murder almost immediately. So when they found her body, the night watchman, a tall, skinny black man named Newt Lee, called the Atlanta police, who just went right through the city and made a beeline for the factory, and he led them down to her body. And Newt Lee was the first one to be accused because as they lifted her up, they found two notes. One of the notes said that, I write this as he play with me, the tall white night witch did it, the tall night witch, that tall slender black man, and it was all broken English. It was very clear that whoever wrote it was very bad at writing and very poorly educated, so it was obvious that it wasn't Leo Frank. And pretty much immediately, Newt Lee says, it looks like they're trying to frame me. So police take in Newt Lee and question him for a very long time, and it's very clear that they're trying to place blame wherever they can. It's almost immediately suspicious, but they initially blamed him. But when the detective, Detective Black of the Atlanta PD, he called Leo Frank two times and he didn't pick up. So they went to his house and they brought him to the factory and they noticed that he acted very squirrely and unusual. And eventually Leo Frank would shoot himself in the foot by basically trying to frame Newt Lee. He said these notes are already here. It purports to be written by Mary Fagan as she's being abused and murdered. And he decided to frame him. So he hires four Pinkertons and within hours of going to the Pinkerton Detective Agency in downtown Atlanta, he's talking with Detective Harry Scott. Now, unbeknownst to Leo Frank, Harry Scott was a good friend with one of the detectives in the Atlanta PD, and the detectives all believed that Leo Frank was guilty. So unusually, Leo Frank seems to have hired one of the Pinkertons to plant evidence in Newt Lee's house, the Night Watch, and this evidence consisted of a neatly ironed shirt covered in blood. So it was obvious that this shirt wasn't even worn when blood was very obviously and conspicuously dripped on it and set on Newt Lee's bed. So very quickly, the suspicion fell on Leo Frank. In fact, the Pinkertons had friends who worked in the Atlanta PD whose daughter 
worked at the pencil factory, immediately was able to identify Mary Fagan and said that Leo Frank gave them all very unusual vibes, very creepy guy who was flirting with the women. And so they bring him into jail. And Leo Frank is almost immediately, he hires a lawyer who is also a prominent Jewish member of the community. And immediately the attitude in the Deep South is one of conspiracy. The Jews are kind of turning against us. And around this time, Commissioner Hugh Dorsey has experienced a number of uh, basically horrible court losses. So he needs something to go and build his reputation, and he decides on sentencing Leo Frank to death. Now, as the trial is commencing and as Leo Frank is in jail, it's discovered that the janitor for the factory, a man named Jim Conley, who'd been arrested dozens of times for public indecency, is trying to rub blood out of his shirt in the factory. He's caught by another night watchman and they bring him in for questioning. Well, after he's basically tortured by the Atlanta police for a week in the basement of their station, he admits to writing the note. They bring him out and he says that Leo Frank hired me to stand guard while while he murdered Mary Fagan, and he also claimed that Leo Frank would often have him stand guard while he flirted with young girls in the factory, he said that Leo Frank came out and dictated the notes to him, making him write those notes down. And then that they had him move the body to the basement, uh, Jim Connolly said that Leo Frank said, I've got wealthy people in Brooklyn, why should I hang for it? But the evidence doesn't add up. Leo Frank obviously had no scratches or defensive wounds on his body. The Basically, every piece of evidence was very obviously very circumstantial. And so they brought him to trial, and Hugh Dorsey basically looked past all of the facts that this was all circumstantial and sentenced him to death. At that point, the governor of Georgia commuted his sentence to life in prison, and he ended his term as governor. Nobody ever would vote for him again. So Hugh Dorsey, from 1917 to 1921, would be governor of Georgia because of the death sentence. And when he was commuted to life in prison, Hugh Dorsey, a number of sheriffs, and other local prominent figures in the community went down to the Milledgeville jail and drove Leo Frank up to the outskirts on a hill overlooking his home and hanged him. And this is the creation of the second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan. Because like the Atlanta race riots of 1906, being spurred on by the play The Klansmen, this murder very publicly invoked the new movie, Birth of a Nation, one of the most influential movies ever created. Now, this remained a very controversial subject for a very long period of time. Jim Connolly, in my opinion, is the murderer. Leo Frank was mostly innocent, although he was an unusual and probably very socially awkward man, and Newt Lee was probably attempted to be framed by Leo Frank in an effort to save himself from the gallows, but by 1915, Leo Frank was lynched and his body was sent back to New York to be buried.